Good morning and good afternoon to everyone across the globe. Welcome to this exciting roundtable of quicker, faster, safer, the future of global healthcare supply chains. I'm Ann Hunter Van Kirk, the Senior Biopharmaceutical Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, and I'm joined by a great lineup of panelists today. To learn more about them, please visit their speaker bios on the forum portal. With that, let's jump right into the discussion. Ahmed, maybe you can start us off with our overall question. How are organizations in the healthcare, pharmaceutical, and transportation industries using hard-earned lessons to transform their global supply chains? How do they plan for future globalized health challenges? Thank you, Anne, and thanks for having me in, in this conference. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, um, I want to start saying uh, during the pandemic, during the beginning of this pandemic, we have seen a big shift in the supply chain, uh, specifically when it came to the uh, medical industry, pharmaceutical. We had shortages uh, in the masks, ventilators, and in medicine as well, um, where companies have to adapt to the new reality. Ports uh, shutting down, aviation industries being affected, all this created a new sense of how can we actually manage the supply chain if it's all centralized in, in, in big regional locations. So the idea of having one location to manufacture and ship across the globe, if it's China or India or any other place, started to change uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, as well countries actually imposing some restrictions on exporting some of the medical product, created a new reality for the pharmaceuticals at the supply chain itself, where how can we actually change this where we can still provide the supplies, create a new supply chain that is more maybe regional, more country based when it comes to getting the medications, the supplies to the to the globe, to the countries, to the people that we need that needs it. This pandemic in specific, because it is a global pandemic, every single country was affected. Um, it's not like one region can help the other. Everyone was actually running to get these supplies uh, and pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers trying to get it to the people that needs it, created a new reality. Now, where the future and how this could actually change the way uh, companies looks at, look at this, I think it's both between the private sector engagement, the pharmaceutical manufacturers, the medical equipment manufacturers, and also state actors where maybe new incentives for these companies to manufacture locally, uh, regionally, locally, or locally in specific countries. Um, as this conference, you know, the Qatar Economic Forum, um, Qatar, for example, is doing the same, was trying to encourage companies to come in, created new incentives, realizing that this is the new reality that we need to face on. Many other countries are doing this. In the US here, we're doing the same, we're maybe giving new incentives. So. I think the new reality is going to become more of how can we establish new trade regulations where the companies, the supply chain industries, when it fits into the medical equipment uh, uh, shipping and getting it to the people that needs it, work their um, agreements and regional contracts where they can provide these supplies in a shorter distances through the uh, new reality of uh, um, potential global pandemic in the future, so we don't run into the same um, issue again. Fantastic. And Patrick and Burton, maybe if you would like to respond to that with with your supply chain expertise and add on, you know, what innovations are needed to reduce vulnerabilities, streamline processes, and improve healthcare delivery. Sure. Patrick, do you want to start us off? You, you want. You want me to start talking? That's, that's fine. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the, the question. And uh, I, I think um, we, we all learned a lot through these, this pandemic. Um, one of my bigger takeaways is the vulnerability of, um, you know, your consistent supply of um, our raw materials. So we're, we're in, we're in, I'm in the manufacturing business and we're trying to get that across the globe. And over time, we went to too many single source situations for various reasons. Um, we have we have some of our materials that um, allow me to say it are not always economically friendly anymore, but they are crucial to the product making, and you cannot find them uh, in too many places across the globe anymore. So th there you are already facing an issue of it's produced only in one 
area of, of the world, in a small area of the world. So try to get your materials then across everywhere in a moment of scarcity. So that, that was a big challenge. And it makes you think, like, can we consider making these raw materials again somewhere else? Or do we need to start looking at alternatives of our formulations? So those are really big questions to which you don't have, you know, easy answers or, or fast solutions. And, and then I want to switch, if you allow me, to the regulatory aspect, because even if you then come to a solution, you need to go through a very lengthy regulatory process throughout the globe, which every country has its specifics or every region has its specifics. And in the pandemic situation that we have faced, for me, this, this has probably been another hurdle that we have to overcome where you could argue does it not make sense to look at a global regulatory solution for a pandemic like we, we faced here? Uh, now, that's a very big, heavy loaded question. I know that too, but um, that, that that's where I see us struggling right now because we have product and it's good product. We can have it supplied everywhere in the world because of regulatory constraints. Okay, so those are a couple of, of bigger takeaways that I'm seeing right now. And I don't know, Burton, if you if you share this or if you have any other insights from where you're sitting. Absolutely, Patrick. I, I appreciate um, that that context. And and what I'll frame up in, in my role and perspective is um, you know, we've got the the upstream manufacturing of the of the goods, the raw materials, and then from from my perspective representing the um the last mile or the last kilometer um, the, from a from an end user standpoint. I think what you and Mohammed both touched on was the, the notion that um, uh, whether it was pharmaceuticals or, or supplies, a lot of the shortages or the stress on the supply chain were um, what I'll call the, the, the lower cost or, or lower margin items. Um, uh, yeah. From the pharmaceutical side, it was, it was a lot of the generics that we were experiencing shortages of. Um, most hospitals, I want to say 90% or 80% of the pharmaceuticals that are dispensed are in that generic category. You know the the masks, the the gowns, the the ventilators. Those are the the low margin um, uh, products that that have kind of been put under a fair bit of stress as we've worked to negotiate the pricing down. And I think on on that side of the upstream, um, I would agree wholeheartedly. I think it's trade relationships, um, government intervention, uh, revisiting of the regulatory requirements for for importing um, or exporting some of those goods um, to allow for that trade to open up. From a um, end user, you know, last kilometer standpoint, uh, what what we are seeing, and um, a number of my peers within the U.S. that I've talked to, are also doing our um, resiliency is the new um, uh, I'll, I'll say buzzword for a lot of healthcare supply chains. There's been this uh, dependency on uh, low unit of measure, just in time delivery, uh, whether it's from a pharmaceutical wholesaler or from med surge distributors. And um, uh, that is what created a lot of the shortages for, for many hospitals. So for an operation standpoint, um, expanding and, and disintermediating uh, some of that um, uh, distributor relationships and establishing more direct manufacturer relationships between health systems um, and manufacturers is, is one avenue for increasing the resiliency. Uh, and then we have the benefit of a, of a warehouse um, that we leveraged quite efficiently during the pandemic and uh, see more uh, more goods and pharmaceuticals running through that warehouse than previously intended. And then the, the second from an innovation standpoint, going back to your question, um, and Hunter, is the, um, uh, the investment in technology um, to help us get some visibility into um, that chain of custody and uh, Kind of where the raw materials for some of these goods are are produced and manufactured so that we can assess some of our suppliers um, and and whether or not they have a, a resilient supply chain themselves and i'll add to that burden because i think that was really relevant from at least what we saw on the pounder side helping i think over 100 different organizations in 35 countries dealing with all types of these problems was uh, most of these organizations, whether government or commercial, just didn't have the end to end visibility to know from the manufacturer to the distribution to transport logistics to all the way to the last mile to the consumer, how they were going to integrate all this data from separate sources into one place and be able to actually make decisions, make better optimizations on that. 
Um, I think uh, one particular one that comes to mind is uh, for all the vaccination programs, uh, we're helping with both the US and the UK doing the data integration platform for it. You know, if there's a disruption at any given point in every single seam, every handoff, it's going to delay uh, your entire, uh, you know, distribution channel and getting things to the to the endpoint. So definitely echo that. And I think uh, we're seeing a lot more organizations actually use this time to to invest in those types of innovations and uh, data sharing agreements as well. With that, um, maybe we'll move on to Dr. Barbo and Raja. Um, and maybe we'll start with Dr. Barbo. Through the world, regularly, though the world regularly encounters local and regional epidemics, how is this year global insidiousness of COVID affecting healthcare planning for the future? So, Ian, did you want me to go first, or uh, Dr. well, I think Dr. Barbo, I think you might be. We can't hear you. Oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yes, we will see more pandemics and they will come with closer intervals. Um, uh, we know that and the healthcare knew that. And yet they were totally unprepared for this uh, situation, which was um, uh, surprising and very problematic. Uh, and, and I mean, healthcare in itself are a mature traditional organization and tend to be very conservative. So whatever risk assessments they did, they never accounted for the situation. Uh, and it's, it was surprising to see how short the planning span was. And I, I, I agree with prior um, speakers here that we need to uh, change healthcare the way healthcare plan uh, and, and create much more innovative solutions. And I think that maybe the less traditional um, healthcare providers will be more lucky in the future because they can, they can more innovatively uh, create solutions which old healthcare providers don't have the imagination and the uh, agility to do. Uh, and I think that um, companies representing good technologies here can help with planning, logistics, visibility, and speed, because, I mean, I was sitting in a hospital, not here in Qatar, but in Sweden, with as the receiver of all this, and we, we lacked so many things because we hadn't planned for it. And I think that's the learning we need to uh, bring with us. Um, it was also obvious that when technologies existed, then hospitals and healthcare providers were quite uh, quick in adapting new technologies. Look, for example, video conferences or IT supported um, uh, doctor's visits. We've been trying to implement that for 15 years to no avail. Nobody wanted them. And then suddenly when the pandemic came, it only took a couple of months. And now every patient, every doctor wants to use this, this technology for consultation. So, if the technology is there and the support is there, and I think maybe Alice and her company can help out here, we will be able to, to um, in a more creative, innovative way, um, deal with the next pandemic. But we have to plan for it now because we are universal and uh, it, it was a, a tough situation. I also work for one of the uh, major um, companies producing ventilators. So I was sitting on the other side of the table as well. And we were surprised on how short the planning, um, how do you say, the planning time for, for healthcare providers was. They wanted ventilators tomorrow, and lots of them. And that's not something you can produce in, in, in a couple of days. It's, it takes planning. And they, uh, they just hadn't planned for it. And uh, it continued all through and still does. So I, I think we need to use the technologies uh, much, much more than we have, but we also need to support these old, slow moving organizations to, to greater agility. Alice, did you want to add on anything to that? Or? Yeah, I, I think. Um... I wanted to add, uh, not to be too doom and gloom here, is on top of 
the already struggle on the COVID response, and we'll see this, I think, continue to exasperate a lot of healthcare industries. Uh, for instance, last year, uh, we were helping on the US COVID response, trying to set up a data sharing network just from, from the hospitals over to the government. And I think one of the things that was even crazier on top of the pandemic was that there was flooding in the Midwest, there were hurricanes hitting Texas, there were wildfires out in California that then even exasperated on top of it, not only the entire supply chain, but also even the data sharing because people couldn't get to work, they weren't without power, there were hospitals without you know, electricity. So um, not to be too, uh, you know, raise too much concern here, but I think there's a lot about robustness, a lot about resiliency, as Bryn mentioned, and I think I'll, there's also a lot about just mutual trust with your, along your entire supply chain of, you know, we're going to get through this together. What are the ways that we can actually set up some of those partnerships, um, you know, not even just contractually, but informally as well. Yeah. And Raja, maybe if you want to join us, you know, what teachings can we learn from different countries' reactions? Well, I mean, um, as, as pointed out, moving into these kind of innovative technologies is what's really required. And if there's any silver lining to, to COVID, I think what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, healthcare uh, providers as well as healthcare systems are now looking at fully digitizing. The infrastructure uh, and, and, you know, my company provides um, blockchain based solutions um, which are connected to IoT sensors as well as uh, just normal sensors. The technology is actually there. The issue that we saw before the pandemic is that most people were very conservative in the healthcare sector. They also were not willing to invest in disruptive mm. kind of technologies, you know, that kind of US mindset as opposed to the European or, or Asian mindset that we tend to see sometimes. Um, has really kind of changed now. There are technologies which can give you the privacy and security of data you need. And, and you know, uh, distributed ledger technology allows the use of private keys to guard your security because most countries are not willing to allow healthcare data to be spread around internationally or more importantly, within private companies to profit from. So there, there is that kind of mindset that can be overcome by using technologies. But, you know, where we're seeing the greatest kind of innovation, I mean, data analytics is, is really quite important. But uh, as is pointed out by Alice, you need the infrastructure to have that data integrity. And that is the promise of some of these new technologies. So, um, you know, so some of the emerging markets, you know, quite surprisingly, countries like Rwanda and Ghana, as I was talking about earlier, are really kind of leading in this area where they're using mobile phone technology to, to ensure that there's data capture and integrity. And nowadays, most things can actually be done just on a mobile phone, including scanning. So we've looked at how do you speed up customs authorizations, even in emerging countries, just by scanning a code uh, on top. Um, you know, we've looked at how you deliver pharmaceuticals uh, in an automated way from procurement as well as delivery by drones. And the technology is available. I think, you know, one of the really important things is to take on that kind of Nordic US mentality of risk taking, which is, look, not ask why, but ask why not and invest in new disruptive technologies. Um, and, and, you know, the, the kind of concerns over human rights can be overcome by technology. I mean, we have an app which is into say a restaurant or a shopping mall because it's blockchain based. You're asked consent to share your vaccination record with the person that's looking at it. So I, I think it's less about um, uh, the technology. The technology is there. It's about the experts you choose and their willingness to use new technologies. Um, and standards, you know, that, that's another point that was made up. We, we, we usually comply with the US DSCSEA regulations for pharmaceutical tracking. The reason being is because you have to record each transfer in the chain of custody. In the US, uh, sorry, in the EU, we have FMD regulations and they only track at the beginning and at the end. So you've got this massive data hole in the middle of the process. So I think, you know, global standards on 
things like labeling, i.e. each packet should be uniquely labeled, uh, will help uh, with data analysis. I think uh, global standards on uh, how you track the chain or transfer in custody would be helpful um, because there are differing standards, as it were, although all of this can be covered by technology. So a lot of it is, is actually mindset rather than, than the availability of technology to be able to do and respond to critical situations like this pandemic. And do you anticipate yeah. any geographic shifts in the supply chain? Yes, I mean, in the Western countries, what we're noticing, particularly here, and we're part of a few projects where actually medicines are moving towards personalization, right? So you will, in the future, uh, be prescribed, and we're, we're involved in a project here in the UK, you will be prescribed a, a, a dosage which is specific to you and your biology, et cetera. Uh, and then when your doctor prescribes this particular medicine, it goes to uh, Siemens that you make these machines where they mix up the medicine out to your house. So it's that kind of direct to home care kind of uh, vision. So centralized kind of large warehousing might in the next 10 years be reduced, especially because what the contributors said, you know, if you have a ship that gets stuck in the Suez Canal, that's going to disrupt your supply chain. So all these talks of just in time supplies, which are important to prevent shortages and 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 or even even over purchasing, I think will go go away when you have far more localized production within countries. And this, I think, is also important for the emerging markets because there's a big debate, as you know, going on about vaccine production locally in African countries. Um, and, you know, with technologies like ours, you can monitor how many vaccines are made, who they're delivered to, and who is vaccinated in a very safe and secure way. And I think that needs to be a big mental shift in terms of the pharmaceutical industry into local production rather than big hubs uh, around the world. Sounds a bit visionary, but I, I, I think we're, we're going to see that shift uh, uh, happening in, in the next 10 years, particularly because of the trade relations politically between countries as well. Does anyone else want to add in on that one? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I can correct to that. We, you know, I'm, I'm in the contract manufacturing business of the pharmaceuticals, right? So we've been asked a lot of questions on do you produce locally where where we are operating so it was very important to go back to the you know geographical location where a product is made and i'm not going to go into further details here but we were lucky due to our large network uh, globally that that we could accommodate those requests and they they were really needed to to speed up the the production of the vaccine so it, it has been of help um, and and it was definitely a, a deciding factor for the companies that came to us and, and contracted to work out to us. So I think your point is well taken, Roger. And if, if I if I may, um, I thought I might chime in on on this conversation as well as far as the um, the shift or diversification from from one central point of manufacturing and and the diversification that uh, Raja and, and Patrick were talking about as far as there being um, uh, kind of a shift to localized production. Um, there might be a, a split path, if you will, between uh, the pharmaceutical supply chain and uh, I'll call them, I'll say med surge supplies. Um, uh, in, anecdotally, what we uh, saw during the pandemic on the, on the supply side of, of that equation um, was a lot of the manufacturers um, uh, that have brand names that we've kind of grown to, to know and trust over the years. Um, uh, a lot of the manufacturing for the masks and other PPE um, isn't necessarily owned by the manufacturers, but, but rather contracted out. And, and a lot of that contracting was, was heavily um, localized in, in China. Um, so what I, I would, would say um, as far as a, a shift of manufacturing is that a number of the suppliers that we've been um, working with, um, establishing more direct relationships and assessing some of their resiliency. Um, it, it seems like a 
general theme is not a complete migration out of China, but but a, a broader diversification so that all those um, subcontracting relationships and, and manufacturing sites aren't, aren't localized um, because of the, the impact that that had during the pandemic. And what sort of impact does that have on on getting high quality API in, in countries? So I think um, I'll, I'll defer to, to some of the other panelists um, as it relates to the active pharmaceutical ingredients, because um, I think that's more of a along the, the localized thread that perhaps um, Raja was discussing or, or Patrick was commenting on. Um, from a supply standpoint, um, it would be less relevant. Um, raw materials critical, and, and we've seen some of the raw materials for those supplies um, migrating uh, as that manufacturing of the finished supply moves as well. I don't, if, 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 I, if I wanted to just you know comment on on part of the moving towards the new technologies and innovation and utilization of that, I think one one thing that at least at the beginning of the pandemic, we witnessed. I mean, at the council, we're dealing with a lot of other companies that exports between medical equipments uh, from the United States to even food products. I think one of the most important factor was there was, first of all, everything was centralized somewhere, but there was a lot of human factor involved, and and that human factor during that pandemic was the major factor that you can utilize. The laborers, the people that actually work at the factories, to the people, again, at the ports, where they couldn't even do their jobs, to the pilots in aviation, where they can actually ship these uh, products somewhere. So I think maybe in the future where we're, we're looking, and I know a lot of these companies that they do that at, at this point, where how can we actually utilize artificial intelligence, self-driving you know, trains, trucks um, in, in the future, where if it's not centralized, things could be actually in a way automated where the manufacturing process somewhat um, less rely, uh, rely less on the human factor again. But that plays a different role. Are we replacing the human factor in in manufacturing these products and de delivering them? It's the the regular medication, the, the people, the diabetic people that not getting their injections at some point, they can get an appointment now online, they can get the prescriptions filled, but who's going to deliver it to them? And that that became a new thing that we're learning, where countries I witnessed, um, I traveled to, to the Middle East at the latter part of the uh, pandemic from, from the US, and I, for, for the first time, I noticed people actually using the delivery services where um, it's, it was not that much utilized in, in many countries in the Middle East. Um, we, we heard a lot of uh, companies doing that in, in Europe and in, in the US, but not as much in the Middle East. But now it's, it becomes a buzzword where they created actually a new word for it in, in different countries on how to get this delivered. That's, that's something new. And I think that if we go back to the bigger picture, the bigger supply chain, not the smaller part getting to the final uh, the patient or the person that needs the product, I think companies will have, in my, my personal opinion, and when it comes to the trade and policies and dealing with states, I think this will give companies, private sector companies, more power when they negotiate with the states on investment laws when it comes to, if you want me to be here, if you don't want to run into this issue in the future, you need to actually modify your rules and regulations where I can actually utilize more technologies, uh, maybe this will not hire as much as many people as specific countries want, but this is taking that risk factor out of the equation and minimizing the future. So I don't know how much companies will have more power when they negotiate with the states these days, but we do, we did see this. Uh, companies dealing with the FDA in the United States with the emergency authorizations, um, these things that happen so fast in many levels, not just on the vaccine, um, it's it's something new, and I think it, bec it will become somewhat permanent, not 100% permanent, but will become permanent when it comes to we need to eliminate many of the risk factors that we've witnessed this year and potentially in many, many other pandemics in the future. And Ravish, maybe do you want to join in here on some of the greatest challenges that the supply chain is facing? Yes, thank you, Anne. So listening to the colleagues, uh, you know, what they're talking about, I think uh, the key question here is, you know, what are these challenges that we're facing for and what are we 
needing to solve for from a supply chain perspective. And listening to this conversation, we're looking at uh, you know agility being one of the key areas in supply chain that needs to be resolved for. And if you look at the conversation around supply chain and being in the supply chain industry some time ago, the, the, the challenges that this industry is facing is no different to the FMCG industry or any other industry where the mindset is a bit mm-hmm. looking at internally internally focused mindset uh, between planning, sourcing, uh, manufacturing, and delivery. And the conversation needs to change. And as Raja said, you know, technology can be the enabler in this. And one of the key focuses that we need to look at into the future is, you know, listening to this conversation, I never heard anyone talk about patient centricity. Now, the conversation in supply chain is what are we, what are we bringing these products to market for is, is the patient. And the conversation needs to change and start to look at things from a patient centricity perspective. Look, uh, legislation is going to be there. These things are going to be there all the time. And this is a big elephant that we need to carve and, you know, start to look at. And when we start to focus at these things, you know, especially when we start to partner with the business, we start to partner with the business with two mindsets. The business of today mindset is what is the business of today doing? And what is the business of the tomorrow needs to be in, in supply chain itself? So when you start to look at this partnership and this integration and moving away from the silo to pro, it becomes a total value chain. And to Raja's point is uh, the concept of the blockchain becomes very, very important in how you maneuver the blockchain through this entire supply chain uh, of global healthcare. And uh, global healthcare is not a supply chain that, you know, is, 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 a, is a supply chain, you know, where you can have a standardization in it because you have different uh, uh, products in it, you have the medical uh, device products, if you have pharmaceuticals, you have the difference. It comes back to saying, what is your business plan? What is your value proposition to reinvent the supply chains? Because the key conversation here is the reinvention. Because planning and execution and uh, uh, is very, very important, the plan, source, make and deliver. But the focus here is saying that digital platform that needs to be brought into the forefront does not, that does not give a competitive advantage to any one of the people in the supply chain, but adds the value from a customer centricity perspective based on a blockchain becomes an important conversation of where you interact with the people, process, technology, data, and information based on legislation. Can I, you, can I just uh, just uh, just raise raise a couple of points on on what Ravesh said. If that's okay, and and the th- the concept of the blockchain is is imp- is important because it allows cooperation, right? You can have one platform where competitors can 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 work together, and you have private keys. I mean, I don't get into the technicals, but like you can guard your data, and you can ensure it's only disclosed to the parties you want it to disclose. So you know, a regulator, for example, the FDA. Uh, EMA or, or, or MHRA case here in the UK, they can have different data access rights to your partners, such as a, a DHL, et cetera, et cetera. So the other important thing is it does work with legacy infrastructure. You can ingest uh, from others. So for Western countries, which already have infrastructure, it does uh, you know, allow advantages over there. But we have to be very clear about this pharmaceutical industry is very different to industries, right? And we've seen this. When there are issues, you get nationalism coming out. We had it here in the UK. You know, we didn't want to start exporting the AZ vaccines and the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, in, in India, you had the issue with the Serum Institute. And, and you know, India suffered really badly uh, even in, through the second wave. So, you need government regulation, which is reasonably uniform, that allows you know everyone to benefit. And blockchain does actually help participants or stakeholders on the platform because it reduces their overall costs generally because they have one platform that they have this co-opetition uh, ability. And it also allows regulators, coming to Mohammed's point, it allows customs officers to clear 
customs very quickly because they can rely on the certificates that are provided by the originating destination. So you don't get fake PPE, you don't get fake masks, or more importantly, you don't get fake medicines infiltrating the supply chain. So, the, you know, the customs officers can wave it through. The regulator can demand forecast for the future because when your population isn't getting medicines and isn't being cured, it's going to be a very disruptive society and it's going to be a free for all. So you do need to have, you know, the ability to be able to ensure you've got medicines available to take care of the health of your nation. Otherwise, it's not just unrest, your country's at peril. So technologies, I, th I think, are important. Um, I think it's which technologies you use in this kind of environment and why are you not using them? You know, it's that whole Jeff Bezos mentality I come back to, which is stop asking why should I use IoT? Why should I use blockchain? Ask yourself, why not? And if I was, you know, a national uh, minister of health right now, I'd be saying, OK, I have nothing right now. Should I be using 3G or should I be using 5G? Well, actually, you should be talking about 6G right now because that's coming in two years. And he shouldn't be talking about cloud infrastructure. He should be talking about nodes and which distributed ledger platform he should be using. Dr. Barbo, did you want to weigh in there? Uh, yeah, I, I, I listened to this conversation. It's highly interesting, and we, we uh, cover a lot of different levels, everything from national levels, international levels, to the level where I am running hospitals currently now in, in Doha. And uh, we talk about the past sense. It's not the past sense. We're still suffering from lack of, of, uh, of uh, material, pharmaceuticals, consumables, uh, because it's not over. And that's partly due to all these levels that we've been discussing, but also partly, and I come back to that, to the poor planning capacity or capability of, of uh, most healthcare providers. That's not what we do, and we're not good at it. So we need help from all these uh, actors, um, the companies, um, the producers of these, um, um, uh, the, the materials that we need. And I think that the companies that could help us do that in, in a efficient and, and visible and, and logistically agile way will be the winners, uh, at least in the near future, because this is badly needed. Uh, hospitals are old fashioned organizations, they're slow moving. And I think the only ones we can learn from are the, 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 the developing countries that jump on a lot of steps and go straight to the cell phone delivery and um, whatever in imaginative ways you can you can get. But um, please remember, we're not we're not done yet. We're in the middle of it, and we're still lacking both pharmaceuticals and consumables and equipment. Um, they're hard to get. Burton, if, I could, um, if I could, yeah, thank you. I was going to chime in on, on both Dr. Frieden's as well as Raja's comments. Um, Raja, I think you asked why, you know, we've got the technology, we've got the solutions, why why aren't we using it? And um, I think it goes back to Ravesh's comment around, you know, knowing, knowing the customer and, and a, perhaps a, a patient-centric view. Um, exactly. Anecdotally, um, before stepping into my, my current role at, at at Johns Hopkins Health System, I had the benefit of consulting and seeing a lot of different health systems and hospitals uh, across the U.S. and and what their supply chains looked like. And um, uh, typically, um, supply chain was in the basement of a hospital, uh, down the hall from the morgue, mm -hmm. and it wasn't really exactly. included in any of the strategic uh, many of the strategic conversations that were occurring in the hospital. Um, I, I jumped at the opportunity of my current role because I, I'm privileged to be in an organization that, that views and, and has elevated its supply chain and considers it a strategic partner. Um, but I, I think on the other side, or as we um, shift into a different phase of the pandemic, to, to echo um, uh, Dr. Frieden's sentiment, um, uh, I, I'm hoping or anticipating there being a bit of a renaissance where there is more dialogue and an awakening around the critical role that the supply chain plays in supporting that delivery of care mm -hmm. to, to patients. And, and with that will come a, a need to um, reinvest in um, resources that are spanning talent, skills, capabilities, 
um, bringing in uh, supply planning as a, a core competency uh, to uh, healthcare supply chains, where, where historically that, is, has, that has not been the case. And um, uh, being able to integrate and pull in uh, some of these um, technology solutions that are going to be game changing and have a, a potential for, for high impact when we think about resiliency and being able to continue um, to deliver critical patient care and, and not be subject to the, the frequency of shortages and, and back orders for um, critical pharmaceuticals and, and mm. supplies. Um, but so I wanted to throw that out there because um, uh, it, it seems in some of the conversations I'm having with my peers that a lot of that is underway. But I think that might be what's perhaps slowing um, uh, so what should be a, a, an accelerated pace of, of a, adapting technology. Hmm. What if we could give a 3D printer to every patient so they can print their own medication at home? Would that be nice? Yeah. So, I mean, c c coming to Bar Barbara's point, um, and 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 uh, Bertin to a certain extent, you know there are companies there that can help you. Doctors yeah. are focused on the patient, as you said. Yeah. They're not focused on technology. What they do want, however, is technology that's easy to use. Now we also work in the cell and gene therapy sector, which is you know the CAR T treatments and gene therapies like Zold Jemsen, which are very expensive. You know, half a million dollars. And we had to work with, I won't say which systems, but we've worked with other hospital systems because, of course, in the UK, as part of the NHS, we have to be interoperable with existing systems. What we were quite shocked by was the kind of uh, future risk uh, rich techie kind of views, right? Uh, we, we make a, a very kind of um, strong principle that we will use social media type of UX or UI to make it easier for the nurses and the doctors to A, get the information they need, and B, to be able to order the, the, the services. And that is all about improving the patient experience. The patient wants to know, am I going to get my treatment on the day you call me in? I don't want to wait for three hours, right? The doctor wants to know, can I use the technology to be able to reschedule my patients as quickly and easily as, as I want? And can I get the records about that patient that I need for that particular appointment, right? So th 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 there is a lot of thought into it. I do believe countries like Qatar, UAE, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, they have the ability and, and, and the kind of centralization because of the population size to be able to really jump forward over and above the current legacy systems we're using here in the West. You know, it's, it comes back to the Rwanda thing. Why, why use copper wires when you can use 5G, right? Uh, and, and it's a similar way in the healthcare sector. But again, Barbara, it's, it's all down to who the experts you choose is. If you get an expert who comes in with the mentality of nobody ever got fired for choosing IBM, then you've chosen the wrong guy because <laughs> You know, it may be comfortable and you're not going to get fired even though you're paying 20 times or 100 times more than, than you need to. But what you do need to ask is, why is it I'm not using these innovative uh, startups that, that, that have got some uh, amazing kind of technology out there to make your life easier? To the point, you know, I'll give you an example. We, we, we use things like Fitbits and smartwatches to monitor a patient's vital sign from their home. They don't need to be in the hospital. And we know in the COVID situation, you want to empty out those hospitals as much as possible. But again, to convince a hospital administrator that, look, we, the technology is available there. The, the question is, well, we're managing. Well, you're not, because you <laughs> are, are, are packed out. <laughs> If, if I if I just say on on on, the, on what Rogers was saying and everyone else, and I think one part that we're getting to is that where is the infrastructure in many places that actually will support that? So are we investing enough in infrastructure? And it's it's very interesting to see some emerging markets, Qatar, uh, many other nations in the GCC and and, and surrounding regions have more stable infrastructure when it comes to digital access to actual delivery infrastructure than we have in the United States. Um, so are we investing enough in infrastructure that will support the new way of delivery? 
from the actual digitization of the uh, of the records or the supply chain to the delivery, getting the actual products. Are we going to change the rules and laws to allow drone delivery at some point where we don't have that human factor? I think these a lot of investments questions that countries need to do. I hate to cut us off, but we are unfortunately out of time. This was a wonderful discussion. Thank you all for your time today, and I look forward to continuing it soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.